what's up? I really don't understand how you guys can sit in your seats. Like, I don't understand how you're not totally insane. I'm totally insane. Like, I don't understand how you could just sit there. It makes no sense to me, but I'm glad that you're sitting there. And uh, I really want to, I just really want you guys to get up and hug each other and love each other, but I know that some people might not want that. I don't want to make you feel bad, so why don't we just do this? Group hug. Come on, group hug, group hug, group hug, group hug. Hug, 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 hug. Awesome. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. And uh, I think that we're here this morning uh, for a lot of different reasons, but I think probably the, the main reason why we're here is I think we all need to understand this, that, that you can't lean on your own understanding, right? I'm clueless, first of all. Like the guy who's talking to you right now is totally clueless. I have no idea what I'm doing. Complete bust in every walk of life. But I have a book. That's a good place for an amen. And it gives me great advice. And so, so why don't we pray together, and, 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 and don't leave me up here, because I'm not the only train wreck in this place, right? And we all need some help. So why don't we, let's just, let, the Bible says we should pray about everything, so why don't we pray about this thing here right now. Father, we are, we are humble before you. We understand that we can't lean on our own understanding, that none of us are smart enough. Joking with my buddy Xavier over here this morning. Lord, about the gray in his beard, and he's got some more wisdom. He's really getting smarter. And uh, a lot of us have got a lot more uh, gray in our, on our mane, but uh, not smart enough. And this morning we acknowledge that your word refreshes the heart and revives the soul. And Lord, we need that now more than ever before. And so we, we just kind of bow before you right now, even though we're not like physically bowing, but our posture maybe in our mind is, is head down, hands up, surrender. We bow before you, God, and we're just telling you right now that we need your help. We need you to speak life into us, Lord, because we're in a battle that we've never, ever experienced before. And more than ever, we need the guidance of your Holy Spirit and, and your Holy Word to lead us in the way that we should go. So please, God, uh, take this sacrifice I put before you, my mind, my heart, my ears, my eyes, every sense that I have. I, wanna, I want us all to taste and see that the Lord is good today. So, so, Lord, with all of our senses, we offer them to you right now. We ask that you would speak to us in every which way, in every sense. Speak to us, Lord. And sometimes your word says that, that your voice is a whisper. And sometimes it says that your word thunders. And we need your voice to thunder today. We need to hear your voice in a way that makes us move. That's what we need today, Lord. So speak to us in that way we ask in Jesus' name. Amen? All right, so hey, grab a copy of, of God's Word. Don't make excuse. Grab a copy of God's Word and open it to Acts 19. They're all over the place. Good morning, Ms. Paula. Snuck in when my eyes were closed. Ninja Paula. So open your Bible to Acts 19. They're all over the place, right? They're on the tables. They're in the pew backs. They're all over the place. Grab your phone, whatever you need to do. Close all the other apps, right, because they're of no value to you right now. None, okay, except your Bible app. So as you're opening the Bible to uh, Acts chapter 19, I would just say that uh, the name Acts is not divine in any way. Uh, the letter is, okay, what, what Luke wrote is divine. That was inspired of God. Uh, but the name of it is not. Now, I'm not ripping the name. I think the name is appropriate. Um, but listen, if you've read the book of Acts, then you probably can agree with me that it very well could be named uh, Acts, which is good. Uh, maybe it's called Results. Could be that too, right? Or it could be, here's my favorite, Expectations. I, I think it could be named Expectations. And, and, and people don't want to hear that in church, right? Don't be, don't be in my grill telling me what to do, right? Nobody likes that. And, and so in church, oftentimes you won't have someone getting into your face and telling you what to do, right? But I'm just telling you that God has some expectations of his people. And, and I'm, just gonna, I'm not going to just say something big and bold like that without backing it up with scripture. So 
I would just tell you this, that Jesus makes it quite clear in one of his parables. It's the parable of the talents, and you can find it in Matthew chapter 25. And you can go there if you want to. You can just make note of it. But in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus makes it very, very clear, right, to the listener that what, when God entrusts you with that that is his, he expects a return on his investment, okay? Big time, all right? Now, now we're, we, we, listen, we expect things from God, right? He said he's this. He said he'll do these things. And we're like, okay, God, do those things. And so a lot of times it becomes a very one-way street, right? God, I need you to do this. Well, God's like, hey, listen, yo, I need you to do this too. So, so let me just say this. In Matthew 25, uh, Jesus would, would go so far. This is bold, right? Jesus is bold. He's no Sunday school cute little shepherd with long hair like Fabio. He's bold, right? This is, he's, he would go so far as to say that in the kingdom of heaven, that which I hope you're a part of. And if you're not, you, you, you better get to be a part of that today, sucker. I'm telling you right now, right? Because I don't know what's happening, but it's unwinding quick, right? So listen, in the kingdom of heaven... That the slave, pause, I ain't no slave, I ain't no slave, right? Right? A lot of talk about slavery in our country right now, right? What used to be? That kind of slavery is ugly. That's, that's forced slavery. Someone gathered up some people and sold them like commodities to other people. That's bad slavery, okay? But this isn't bad slavery. This is good slavery, okay? This is the word in Greek called doulos, right? Jesus said you can't serve two masters. He didn't say not to serve a master. When he says you can't serve two masters, he's implying that serving a master is okay, but you can't serve two of them. You can't serve 200 of them. You can't serve 2,000 of them. We don't have two masters. you got 2,000 masters. We got a, we're, we're spreading our loyalty and allegiance over a wide range. And Jesus said, you can't serve two masters. The Bible says that whatever you say, me, me, whatever you choose to obey becomes your master. See, some people you were talking about, I don't want to get into it, but some people, right, their master was chosen for them. And that's not cool. But in Christianity, you get to choose your master, right? And so if you've bent the knee to Jesus Christ in any tangible way, then he, he is your master. You know what master means? Yes, sir. Whatever you say, I do. If you tell me not to, I won't. You want me to do it now? I'm busy. I don't care. Do it now. And you say, yes, sir. That's what being a slave is. Listen, Peter Paul, James, all three Bible writers, in their letters, as they open their letter, guess how they address themselves? I, Paul, I, Peter, I, James, a slave of Christ, right? And don't read some Bible that gives you some lame bondservant crap, okay? It's a, you know what doulos means? Slave. A slave. I don't like being a slave. Christians are slaves, right? Joyous, happy, singing, dancing, generous, super psyched up slaves, right? Because listen, the pressure's off. I don't have to run my own thing anymore, right? I got a boss who knows what he's doing, and, he, and all things work out for the good to those who love the Lord, love their master, and are called to master's purpose. We have a king, we have a master, and that's a good thing. And so he says here, listen, he says, that in the kingdom of heaven, that the slave, the do loss, that does not bring a return on investment will be, let's read it. You ready? Tell me if you're ready. For to everyone who has, if you bring back a return, more will be given. I want it to be me. And he will have more than enough. I want that to be me. I want that to be you. But for... From the one who does not have this return on investment, from the one who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. And for good measure, verse 30, 
and throw this good for nothing into the outer darkness in that place where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Very sobering words from a very clear Savior. The bar for the kingdom of heaven is high. The bar of the king of heaven is high. And that's why the bar for the book of Acts, the book of results, the book of expectations is also very high. And so when you understand this to be true, you, you, it makes sense that when Paul says in Romans 12, listen, th this is what acceptable worship looks like. Give your entire body to him. Everything that you are. Everything that you are, everything that you have, every, this, listen, that that's your, that's, that's acceptable worship. So I asked you this last time. If you're not doing that, if that's your acceptable worship, and don't tell me, well, that's not what he means. If he needed to change what he meant, he'd change what it said. If that's reasonable worship, if that's the worship that God will accept, what other kinds of worship will he accept? None. And I'm saying this and I'm yelling to, to accent, uh, what's the word, accentu accentuate, accentuate, what is it? Accentuate the point. I want you to get the point. I don't want you to walk out of here half-hearted, on the fence, on the grandstand, you know, thinking maybe it's enough. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. And if there's anything else I could say is that if for, for 12 years now, I've been driving home this point, and people still, look at here, you still don't get it. You don't get it. I wrote this down in my notes. Maybe you'll find it helpful. Maybe you'll write it down too. I wrote, salvation is the most costly free gift I ever received. Amen. <laughs> salvation is the most costly free gift I ever received. Right? You, did you go to the cross? Yeah. No. Did you go to the cross? Did you die on the Roman tree? No. no Jesus did. Can you buy that? No. Can you, can you, can you, beg please, would you, no, no, he does it, right? He does it because of his love for you, right? That's the great, well, where's the grace? There's the grace. That's more than enough grace than anyone could ever have or deserve in their lifetime. He went to the cross on his own for you, even though you were a sinner and didn't deserve it. That's grace on steroids, right? There's the grace. So, so it's free, right? It's free. It didn't cost you nothing. But it's going to cost you something if you take it. It has to cost you something, right? Because it's in the Bible. And if this is truly God's word and you believe what it says, then you've got to start thinking this way. You can't hold on to this. I get it for free. I get it. I get it. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. It's not the teaching of the Bible, okay? So, so listen, the bar is high. And what we see in the book of Acts is the proper response for you and I. It's not to look back. Listen, every, the Bible says that every word, every word of Scripture is God-breathed and is useful to teach us what is right. So therefore, to say that it's in there as purely a historical document to teach you about what happened is cutting it short. It's to teach you what is right. What does that mean? I should do it too. I mean, we're not, who's here? Who graduated from Harvard Law School here? No one. No one's super bright in this room. We're just regular folks, but we can understand that. Why would he teach us what is true and right if we're not supposed to do it? It's not to praise Paul. Man, that guy was awesome. Look at Peter. He was a wimp. Now he's bold. But I'm not. Buffoonery. That's what that is, right? <laughs> Buffoonery. And so we read the book of Acts because in the book of Acts, it clearly details the proper response for the, for the person who hears the gospel. 
If you hear the gospel and you want to embrace Christ and be his, this is the proper response, okay? And there's no lowering the bar because they did that, but we only have to do this. You're going to see in the book of Acts incredible church growth, and you're going to see in our society incredible church decline. So simply evaluating what they did and the results they saw versus what you're doing and I'm doing and we're doing and seeing the results we're getting doesn't take a brain surgeon to realize we're doing something wrong. And so when we come to church, we need to come with our hands open saying, listen, God, I'm wrong, you're right, help me do what you want so your kingdom can come, right? Listen, so listen up. Not only is it the proper response for you and I, but don't forget, we're in this together, right? Right, we're a family. And, and this, is a, this study of the book of Acts is to see what the church did, not just what Paula does, not just what Roger does or X-Men. Like, that's good. You got to do your own thing. But we're doing this as a corporate gathering, right? What are, what's the church supposed to be doing? And I would say that the, that, the, that the information we see, the historical documentation of the book of Acts is not only proper response for you and I, but it's also what God needs us to do so that we can accomplish the task of reaching the entire world with the gospel, to, to, to preach to the ends of the earth, to make disciples of all people, right? This is what needs to happen, right? Listen, what team, what team, who played sports when they were growing up? Anyone play sports? Anyone? 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 What team wins the championship when the players show up whenever they want to? You know, we'll just run. Did you just raise your hand? You played? What'd you play? Baseball. So when the, I don't even, I never play baseball. I hate baseball. Love you. Hate, love you. Don't come over that wall. But uh, listen, I don't even know what all this means. But when the, when the manager's sitting there going like this and all that crazy, you know, Pope stuff, tickling their ears and picking their nose and stuff, there's a, there's a play in there, right? What happens when you just decide, yeah, I'm not doing that. I'll show up for practice when I want, and the coach says, do, 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 ba, 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 and I'm not doing it. How many championships are you going to win? Show me how many you're going to win. None, right? But we think that in the church. How many, how many armies march out to battle, and they don't, some of them bring their guns, but some of them don't. Some of them fall into alignment, and some of them are just off doing their own little Forrest Gump thing over here while the rest of them are going into battle. How many of those fights are they going to win? None. How many companies develop a great product and they just go, you know what? Maybe we'll put on an ad on TV. Maybe we won't. Maybe we'll market it. Maybe we won't. You know, we're trying to develop this new product and our research and development team they didn't show up this weekend. You think that item's going to sell? How successful do you think they're going to be? How about the farmer? Any farmers in the room? You cut grass. You don't grow it. <laughs> Nobody better be growing grass up in here. And I'm just saying, <laughs> no, nah, keep it down, keep it down, keep it down. Keep it down in the back row. Listen, how, yeah, yeah, with permits, right? It's a new world. Please don't, that's a whole other sermon for another day. Just please, don't get me started, okay? But listen, if you're, if you're a farmer, right, what happens to the crop when the farmer just kind of sits in his rocking chair and just says, you know, yeah, I'm tired. I really don't feel like watering it today, you know? I mean, I see all those weeds out there, but I'm, you know, I'm just, I'm just, listen, I'm not in the mood. I'll just water it whenever I decide it's okay to water it. What's he bringing to the market that year? My mom would say bupkis. It's Jewish stuff. Bupkis. Poop. That's what you're bringing. You're bringing nothing, right? So we understand that in all arenas of life, that half-hearted 
do it when I want to, when I feel like it, won't work, right? And so if the kingdom of heaven means anything to you, if, if seeing Jesus lifted up and exalted and worshiped, if seeing the lost get out of darkness and brought into the light so they don't have to go to hell for eternity, if, that, if those things mean anything to you, then you know you can't just show up and do things when you feel like it, okay? And that's what's happened in our world. I think that something may be changing here it seems like people are starting to maybe get it are you getting it i hope you're getting it seem to be showing up on occasion now which is kind of nice <laughs> so let's be like uh you guys watch the olympics you guys have watched the olympics before right it's not new hey there's this thing called the olympics did you know that Every four years, right, all these people get around, they start running and jumping and stuff. It's really cool. Check it out sometime. So it's this thing called the pole vaulter, right? So the pole vaulter, right, grabs a hold of this pole, right, and he sees this other high bar, and he, and he runs after that thing, right? And he runs down the runway and plants that pole and tries to get up over the bar. That's what we got to do today because the kingdom of heaven is a high bar. So we got to run after that thing, and we're going to run after right here in Acts chapter 19. So I know you guys have already turned there. Give me the grace to get there for a second, and I'll read with you. Hope you're not in a rush. All right, Acts chapter 19. We're going to start in verse 8, okay? This is happening in the, in the city of Ephesus, right? And if you read the Bible before, you understand that there's a book called Ephesians. That's where Paul planted, a, he started a church there, and then he wrote a letter back to them to encourage them. But this is happening <clears throat> early on in Ephesians, and Paul's going around, he's spreading the gospel. Anyone he talks to, he's sharing the gospel. Everywhere he goes, he's sharing the gospel. So like, everywhere you go, you should be? Okay, gotcha. You're learning. So he says here in verse 8, then he entered the synagogue, just kind of just like, kind of like this here, right here, right? It's kind of like a synagogue right here, right? It's a place of worship, a house of worship where the saints gather and have been for thousands of years and they gather to worship their great king. And that's what you're doing here today, right? So he enters the synagogue and spoke boldly over a period of three months, engaging in discussion and trying to persuade them about the things related to the kingdom of God. I was just telling you about the kingdom, wasn't I? Almost sounds familiar. But when some believers, when some, I'm sorry, but when some became hardened and would not believe, slandering the way. So we call it Christianity today, right? We're Christians. What are you? I'm a Christian. Okay? The Bible here, you see it, they didn't start talking about Christians till they were over in Antioch. But here, it's described as the way, right? What does that mean? There's a way to think. There's a way to act. There's a way to live, right? There's a way to dress. There's a way to talk. There's a way. There's a way, right? Jesus is the way, and so we're supposed to copy him, right? So just like let that bear its weight on you. Are you living the way that you should? Are you living the way that the Bible describes for you? Are you living that way? Introspection, right? Introspection. And some people were slandering the way, in front of the crowd. So it was not like, you know, Paul's like, I am right here talking and, and, and you guys are listening. Uh, in that setting, he was talking and someone else was talking. And they're yelling back, no, that's not the right way. That's not the right way. I'm glad that we have people here right now that are actually willing and wanting to listen and learn. I'm glad no one's screaming at me, but bring it on. He withdrew, right? Because they were slandering he withdrew from them, and he met separately with the disciples. So he took the people that believed. They weren't slandering. He took the people that believed. And it says, conducting discussions every day in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. And some dude, he had some, think auditorium, okay? Think auditorium. And this went on for two years so that all the inhabitants of the province of Asia, both Jews and Greeks. Now, pause it for a second. I've said this before. We're talking a lot about racism in our country right now, right? The Bible doesn't speak of racism. 
The Bible only speaks of two races, Jew and other. You're either one of his chosen people or you're not. And here's what's happening here. It says that these discussions went on in this lecture hall of Tyrannus, and this went on for two years every day so that all the inhabitants of Asia, all, say all, all the inhabitants, that means, listen, every person who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord. That's what it says, right? It says they heard the word of the Lord. That's pretty awesome, right? So now listen for a second. Here's the, look at the name of the, the message, the series, right? To the ends of the earth. That's what we're called to do, right? Bring the gospel to the ends of the earth. Jesus said to make disciples of all people. Make disciples of all people. Baptize them and then teach them all that I've taught you, right? So I teach you some stuff, Jesus said, and then I need you to go and teach how many of the people? All, all of them, right? All of them. So let, let's, uh, let me ask you a question. In, in trying to achieve this goal, think about this. Have you ever wondered, have you ever stopped and wondered, how in the world did this little religious movement that started with this dude that comes from Nazareth, what, what comes from Nazareth? Nothing. This little podunk, you know, from this dude that came from Paisley. I mean, just think about that. It's just some little town, right? From this, from this guy that came from Okahumka. <laughs> so how did this movement from this one little obscure dude from this little itty-bitty nothing town who was like, um, he was a rabbi, and a carpenter's apprentice to his dad, like a little part-time carpenter, blue-collar guy, who only lived 33 years. He only had a minute. Of, I've been doing this for almost 15 years. He only did it for three years. And then he got killed. Killed. How, how, how did that get to you? Did you ever think, I mean, seriously, have you ever thought about that? How does that little movement from that little dude, how did it get two, over now, 2,000 years ago? 6,500 miles away from here. Like, they didn't have planes, they didn't have the boats that would cross the ocean, they didn't have rocket ships and cell phones and the internet. 6,500 miles might as well be a million miles, right? How did this thing get to you? I mean, don't be flippant about, I'm not talking about the big ethereal thing. I'm talking about the practical. How did it get to you? Like 2,000 years ago. You say that number, it's like, it's no big deal sometimes because you say it over and over and over and again in church, right? Let me give you some perspective. I'm 51 years old. I'm old. I'm old. I, listen, trust me. When I got here this morning, when I got out of bed this morning, my left knee almost went out to the left. And it hurt. I had to come here. First thing before I did anything spiritual, I hung upside down on the table out there, the, the, the inversion table, to stretch my back out because it hurt so bad and my knee was killing me. Anyone else feeling that? Right? We're all feeling it, right? Getting up there, right? Getting up there, right? Let me tell you something. You're getting up there. We're all getting up there. All of us are getting up there, right? I'm 51 years old. You know how long ago this all happened with Jesus? 40 of my entire lifespans. Take what I've experienced in just my little thing and multiply it times 40, Right? My life, my life, my life, my life, back, 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 40 times over. That's how, how long ago it was that this all happened. And somehow it got to you. How did this happen? Well, I could tell you that one of the main reasons why it happened is what we just read. Because Paul and those other disciples there in the story, they did something that caused, make disciple of all people, right? 
They did something that caused every, every word of Scripture is God-breathing useful to teach us truth, right? So don't, don't miss this. They did something that caused all the people in Asia to hear the word of the Lord. Think about that. Every single inhabitant of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Every one of them because of something they chose to do. And so how would we, like them, follow this mandate to reach the ends of the earth, to make disciples of all people and not be the farmer that decides to water when they want to? How do we do this? How do we accomplish the mission that God puts you on? And I hope that you're as inspired and fired up to hear this as I am to teach it. But listen, I know how they did it. I made up some stuff. Right? Not here. Right? We're going to look in the Bible. What does it say in the story we just read? How does this get done? How do we actually fulfill the mandate to make disciples of all people? First and foremost, you see it there in the text. They engaged. They engaged, right? You can be nice, and you can be kind, and you can be uh, generous, and you can be charitable, right? All you want, but at some point, you got to get off the fence. You got to get into the ball game, right? And engage somebody. Talk to them. Open your mouth and engage into the battle as a soldier of Christ. You can't just come and listen. You have to engage. Do something, right? You do something. And too many of us are not doing anything. We're just sitting around, waiting for everybody else. Don't worry, the pastor will do it. No, I won't. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do right now. What are you doing? Pull the stinking trigger, man, and do something for the kingdom of God. Do something, right? They engage. You have to actually be a part of what God is trying to do, right? They engage the people. And then it said that they tried. That's the word there, right? He tried. What does this imply? that it's hard, right? I don't want to say anything. I might lose a friend, might lose a family, might lose my job, might get ripped on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all those things. I don't want to do that. Listen, we're, you're going, if you've engaged in any way, if you've done the first thing and engaged, you understand that you're going to get pushed back and people are going to hate you and say that you're, that you're, you're, you're a hypocrite, you're judgmental, Keep your religion to yourself, man. This ain't Sunday, preacher. Keep it to yourself. Push back, push back, push back, right? So so what do you have to do? When you engage them, they push back. What do you got to do? You got to try harder. Flex your muscle and do something, right? Do something. You got to try. And then what's the third thing? It says that they spoke boldly. See, see, Paul told Timothy, "I, I, I, I urge you in the presence of God. To preach the word. Preach the word, right? In season and out. Whether you feel like it or not. Whether the people want to hear it or not. Like you came here this morning because you wanted to hear it. Right? Guess what? The people that aren't here, they don't. If they wanted to hear it, they'd be there. They'd be at a church somewhere. But most people, as you know, they don't want to hear it. But Paul says to Timothy, listen... A lot of people aren't going to want to hear truth. They don't want sound doctrine. They don't want wholesome teaching. They want teachers, and they're going to gather them up to tell them what they want to hear and tickle their ears. And Paul's like, no, that's not what you do. In season and out, you preach the word. You correct, you rebuke, and you encourage your people with good, solid teaching, right? So you speak boldly. The the church is is the pillar and foundation of the truth, Right? So the church needs to speak up. And guess what? I'm not the church. You are. I'm just one member of this family. You're the church. You're the church. Karen, you're the church. Cindy, you're the church. You have to speak up. You have to engage. You have to tell people, don't just bring them here to listen to me. You have a mouth. You have a Bible. And you have the Spirit of God living inside of you. So speak up and engage. Tell them the truth. Tell them the truth. Listen, what's, more, what's, what's worse, offending them or watching them go to hell forever? That'll inspire you, I hope. They were engaging. They were trying. They were speaking boldly. But let me ask you a question. When were they doing this? 
Every day. Every day. Every day. I don't want to be judged. Listen, I'm not the legalist guy. Okay? I'm, I don't want to ever insert anything into the Bible that the Bible doesn't insert itself. Okay? I don't want to do that. I just want you to marinate on this for a second. He did it for three months in the synagogue. And then he went to the lecture hall of Tyrannus, whatever that place was, auditorium of some sort. Just think about this. Two years more. That's eight hundred and twenty days. For eight hundred and twenty days straight, they gathered to discuss the scriptures with other believers. And, of course, inviting others in to persuade them that they might know Christ, too. Listen, over 800 days in a row, jobs, kids, houses to clean, farming, cattle, sheep, they had it. Over eight. Hundred days in a row they met. Not to condemn you, but to let God's word bear its weight on you personally. We've had 29 Sundays just this year. How many of them have you been in church? Don't yell out everyone. I don't want to hear any righteousness in this room. We've had 213 days so far just this year. And how many of those days has the kingdom of God meant enough to you like it did to them to put aside your selfish things that Jesus said you have to put aside selfish things, pick up your cross and follow me. How many of those 213 days have you spent with other believers and non-believers gathering together to discuss the scriptures? Ends of the earth ministry here, right? Make disciples of all people. Listen, they reached, as a result of what they did, they reached all the inhabitants of Asia. They didn't reach all the, inhibi of the inhabitants of Leesburg. They, met, they, they reached all the people who lived in the entire continent. They met every day for over 800 days. Think about it. And as a result, all the inhabitants of Asia heard the word of the Lord, right? So you see the picture, right? You're, you're in the message. You're in the Bible, right? Think, see it. They were, they, were engaging the, the, they were engaging the people daily. They were engaging the people boldly with the truth. And that's what I'm doing with you right now. Right, I, And I've been doing it, trying to do it faithfully as best I know how. Definitely could do better. For, for, for 12 years I've been doing this same thing. And we're doing it again right here, right now. I'm engaging you boldly with the truth that's found in God's word. And there you are. You're the people. You're sitting there and you are listening to this right now. And so what was the purpose, think about this, what was the purpose of their gathering every single day and speaking boldly? What was the purpose of this? And what's the purpose of us, of us gathering right here, right now? In the same way, right? Why did they do it? Why are we doing it right now? Is, is doing this right here what we're doing? Is this the end game? Is this what we're trying to accomplish? Get together and listen? Is it? Kinda. Kinda. Here, listen to me. Don't listen to me. Listen to the Lord. 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. Listen, just listen up, okay? 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. And what you, this is Paul speaking, right, to Timothy. And what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. Does that not describe this room right now? Right? What you've heard from me preached in front of the people, which is what you're hearing right now, 
He goes on, he says, commit these things to other men and women so that they can teach others the truth. That's the end game. That's the goal of this. It's not so you can come and listen. Some of you have been coming and listening and coming and listening and coming and listening, not just here, but at other churches for decades, and you're still coming and listening and coming and listening. But we're supposed to graduate, man. You got, there's got to be a day when you flip the tassel over, and you go from hearer, right, from hearer to doer, right? That's what graduation is. I move. That's what James says. At some point, you've got to go from hearer to doing what this thing says. This is the scary part. Lest you deceive yourself. See, Christians aren't the people who just come to church and listen and say amen. If you're not the other half of it, by doing what, so when the preacher gets up, as I'm doing right here, right now, and I'm sharing something with you from God's word, right, the Christian, unless you're deceiving yourself, actually hears it, and then guess what? They do it. They move from student to teacher, always listening, always the student. I'm still a student. I watch guys on TV and and the internet. I've got mentors that talk into my life. So I'm still learning, I'm still studying, but every week I'm right back up here again, taking everything that Jesus teaches me and I'm passing it on to you. Why? So you'll take it and pass it on to someone else who will in turn pass it on to someone else. Disciples making disciples. That's what the church is supposed to do. And we got to do this, guys. That's what Christianity is. It's more than just what you believe, it's also what you do, right? So let me ask you a question. The, way, the, the word of God has to bear its weight on you. If, you're, if, you're, if it's not, in, then nothing is accomplished here today. Nothing. So my question is this. Have you been connecting and are you planning right now in your mind to connect with people that are believers in this church, other people in this room, or some that are not here today, and some coworkers and neighbors and family that aren't in your church that might need Jesus are you, what's your plan to gather with them and share what I'm sharing with you today? Because that's what we're seeing in the book of Acts, right? I'm not making it up. And that's what we see in 2 Timothy 2 too. You've heard me say these things in front of all these witnesses. Now share them with other people. So what's your plan of action to share them with other people? They gathered every day to do this, man. They gathered every day to do this. That's how it got done. A farmer doesn't bring a crop when he waters once in a while when he wants to. A team doesn't win a Super Bowl when they show up for practice when it's convenient for them and have nothing better to do. And the kingdom of heaven doesn't reach the ends of the earth and reach all people. When you don't engage, when you don't try, and when you don't speak boldly, it's not going to happen. Now, I don't know what it looks like for all the inhabitants of America to hear the word of the Lord all the time. Imagine that, though. Can you imagine? What would this country be like and our influence on other nations across the world if, listen... If not just you, but every inhabitant of the entire country was daily hearing the bold word of the Lord proclaimed to them all the time. I don't know what that would look like, but it makes me smile. I see some other smiles, right? I would love to know what that looks like, right? And guess what? I think Jesus would like to know what that looks like, right? I, I mean, let's just take a vote. Who, would, who thinks Jesus, show of hands, who thinks Jesus would like everyone in this country to hear the word of the Lord every single day? Right. Okay. How do you reach? How do you? Oh, yeah. All right. There's my love. So everyone say, hey, Lori. Hey, Lori. That was, you could do better than that. Let's, let's, pretend, let, let's pretend we're at chairs and Norm walked in. <laughs> Lori. There we go. All right. There we go. I like it when you're here, man. This is a way better church with Lori here. You just got that smile, man. Always happy about, you must know something. You got something on me? No, 
<laughs> I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. So, so listen, I don't know what it would look like, but, but here, here, here's where we're at, though, right now. You're in your seats. You're in your seats, and you're hearing me pass on to you boldly as I can. Might tick some of you off. It always has. But I'm, I'm boldly speaking the truth to you. You're hearing it, right? And so what does it look like for you to graduate? What does it look like for you to move from hearing what I'm saying to sharing what I'm saying? Right? That's the only way the kingdom of heaven is going to reach the ends of the earth. That's the only way it actually... Re- what town were you living in? Where were you born? Uh, New, Jersey. New Jersey. What city were you living in when you got saved? In the villages. Man, if it can pierce the villages, it can go anywhere. <laughs> How does this little movement of this one obscure dude 6,500 miles away over 2,000 years ago, reach him in the villages. I'll tell you how it gets done. The people engaged, the people tried, and the people spoke boldly. Every one of them, right? That's how it happens. That's how it happens. So what's it look like for you personally to move from hearer to doer? To be the person that hears these things spoken to you in the crowd of witnesses and now you're going to commit them to other people. What's that look like for you? Does it, does it, maybe your first step is, you know what? I haven't been here all the time. Like, I show up once in a while, once every month or so, maybe twice a month. I don't go to prayer night. I don't go to discipling classes. I don't do that stuff, but I show up once in a while. Maybe your first step and the, the thing that your soul needs to inspire you so that you'll actually get off your duff and do something, maybe your commitment is, you know what? I'm going to come more often now. I'm going to make a commitment to you, Jesus, that hell or high water, I'm going to be there Sunday morning at 10 o'clock doing my part to encourage the other believers, bringing my gifts with me, and listening to the word of God so that I'll actually do something. Maybe you could do that. Everyone should applaud that one. That's easy. That's easy, right? But maybe, maybe what it looks like for you to go from hearer to doer is maybe you need to start a home group. Right? The Bible talks about an Acts, but they met here, right? They met, in the, they met in the synagogue, they met in the temple, they met in the lecture hall of Tyrannus, but they also met in homes. So maybe you need to get off your duff. That's just, why can't I just be honest, right? Let's get off our duff and, and open up your house maybe once a week. Big sacrifice here, man. Big sacrifice. Open up your house once a week and invite some friends over from your church like they did here and then maybe some neighbors and friends and coworkers that you'd like to see saved. Bring them together. Make them come together and share, right? That's what it says. Share what the preacher is sharing with you and share it with them. Continue the conversation. Engage with the people. Try really hard. Speak boldly. Persuade them of their need for Jesus Christ, right? Do that. Maybe that's who you are. Maybe it's you need to find that one special person that God lays in your heart and make a disciple. I have this for you. It's, it's discipling curriculum. You don't even have to be smart. You just need to know how to read. God makes it super easy for you, man, to find someone who needs to know more about Jesus and say, let's get together once a week for coffee. I'll get you this workbook, and I'm going to take you through it for the next three to four years, and I'm going to show you what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ so I can help you understand your gifting and release you back into the world so you can do the same with other people that I'm doing with you. So this is what, listen, I have this. It's free, man. It's free, and I've, uh, someone should be coming up to me before the service is over and gra- grabbing some books. And go, I want to go do my part to advance the kingdom to the ends of the earth. It's not somebody else's responsibility. Whose responsibility is it? It's my responsibility, right? Ends of the earth ministry. Make disciples of all people. Maybe that's what it looks like for you. I don't know what it's going to look like for you, but God has some expectations And living out those expectations is his acceptable worship. And in only living those expectations out will the kingdom of heaven that you are called to advance will do so. Only in that way. 
only in that way. Okay? I'll just say that the call of Jesus on every single one of your lives. Listen, listen up now. Every single one of you. The call of Jesus on your life demands this response. It demands it. There's no room for I'll, I'll, I'll choose you when I want. That's not lordship. I'll come when I think so. I'll come when it's convenient. I'll help when I can. Right now I'm kind of busy with other stuff. <clears throat> really? I'm sure glad Jesus wasn't busy with other stuff that day at Calvary. Amen. Sure happy that wasn't the case. So let's, um, let's move on here in the text, but let's not move on like we usually move on. Like, move on, okay, that was good. Thanks, man. I'll forget that one in about 14 seconds as we get into the new one. But let's move on this way. So, because this next part of this text, it'll actually help rivet the truth of what you just learned right to your heart so that you'll actually do something, okay? So let's, let's grab that pole vaulting pole again, right? And let's run down the, the line and, and plant that pole in the ground and go up, okay? Go up. Let's go back into the book of Acts 19, verse 11. You there? You have in front of you? You looking at it? Don't make me shame you in church. You know I do it. Who doesn't have a Bible in front of him? I dare you to say you don't have one. Why would you come to church without a Bible, right? This guy, look, he's brand new here. He's got a Bible. All the, no, you don't. You have one in your phone, right? You lost yours? That's not good. Do you need another one? Because we've got a bunch of them up there in the case. We might have one up there with big letters. Then we have this mystery guy who shows up at our church and donates all these brand new in the package Bibles for people who need a Bible. Praise the Lord, right? It's got to be King James. Man, you're getting picky on me. I'm trying to give you a free Bible. I don't know. There may be one up there, really. There may be a... I found a really nice... You know, people, if you really want a good Bible, just ask me and I'll find one in the lost and found. People leave them all the time. I found a real nice one for, for Jerome, and he's got this big, huge King James. It's like the size of this table. It's got writing the size of, like, the first line on the doctor's chart, man. It, that's, what it, that's what you need. It's probably your old one. <laughs> I got one of yours, actually. I, I got Frankie's Bible. That's my next Bible. I love that thing. I can't wait to use it. So listen. So here we are, Acts chapter 19, right? You guys all there? Okay. Verse 11, God was performing extraordinary miracles by Paul's hands. So that even face cloth, this is kind of crazy, right? Even face cloths or work aprons that had touched his skin were brought to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. You guys are probably wondering, like, that's not in the Bible I'm reading, right? I usually read out of the New, the New Living Translation, don't I? I'm not reading that this week. I'm reading the Holman Christian Standard because some of the story I'm about to share with you today is really, really blurry in the New Living Translation. I don't like it, so I'm not using it. But it's okay. I'll point out where there's some issue there so you can understand. I want clarity. So, so let's just keep reading, okay? So, so he's performing ma- major, major crazy miracles. All the evil spirits and the diseases are leaving out of the people, right? Incredible. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists attempted to pronounce the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, quote, I command you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Seven sons of Sceva, so this guy Sceva was a Jewish priest, a chief priest, Mr. Important. And these guys were doing this also. So there was some itinerant Jewish exorcists. We'll talk about that in a second. But then also these seven sons of the priest we're trying to do the same thing, right? And the New Living Translation doesn't really explain that clearly. It's very blurry. It kind of assumes there in the way they've translated and rendered it that we're actually accomplishing the mission of casting out demons, okay? And that's not the case. Let me just read on. Seven sons of Sceva, the Jewish chief priests, were doing this. The evil spirit answered them when they said this, this come out of, come out of this guy in, 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 in the name of, uh, by the Jesus, the, the demon says this, and it wasn't the person, it's the actual evil demon inside the person says, Jesus I know, it's, it's like, I think this demon's from England, he's like all proper, right, he's a proper, he's a proper demon, he's kind of a nice demon, 
Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? Right? Who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit leaped on them, overpowering them all. This guy this is tough. And prevailed against them. So he fights them and wins. <laughs> this is awful. So they, the seven men, run out of the house naked and wounded. But you think you've had a bad day, right? These guys got the clothes beaten off of them. This is bad. <laughs> This became known to everyone who lived in Ephesus. I, I, seriously, if you make it to the Bible and that's how you're remembered, I, I, was the, yeah, I, was the, I was the guy who walked on water. I was the guy who rose this, raised this guy from the dead. I got my clothes beaten off of me. <laughs> this became known to everyone who lived in Ephesus, both Jew and Greek. So in other words, everyone, right? Then fear fell on all of them. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many who had become believers came confessing and disclosing their practices. Of course, this, this would automatically refer back to what practices were being done. Right? Some of this sorcery junk that these guys were trying to pull. While many of those who practiced magic, there's that sorcery there, collected their books, their magic books, right, and burned them in front of everyone. So they calculated their value and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. The New Living Translation, which I'm not using, they rendered that several million, I think. Know what it says? So let's just say... Uh, 50, a piece of silver back then was a day's wage. So let's just say you work all day, you make 50 bucks. Let's just say it's 50 bucks, right? You know what that is? Two and a half million dollars. Two and a half million dollars. So they burned all this stuff worth millions, right? And in, in, in this way, the way you just read, in this way, the Lord's message flourished and prevailed. It won, right? It won. It was increasing. The church was building. The congregation was growing. There was more people, right? So, this is a super cool story of demons and violence, if you're into that. I kind of am. Exorcism, book burning, you know, big public bonfire. People, you can just kind of visualize it, right? Kind of a cool movie. Demons and, and people are getting the tar beaten out of them. Their clothes are beaten off of them. And people are, uh, exorcisms and all, right, that's awesome. And we read the story because we want to know what happens. History is important. We want to know what happened, right, because we want to frame our response around this. And so we don't just read it to find out what happens. We want to pause and we want to kind of think about this. Like, that's why the Bible says to meditate on God's word day and night. So you can be like a plant a tree planted by the, the river water, sucking up nutrients and, and bearing fruit in every season and your leaves would never wither, right? You want to gain from this because you need to know not just what happened, but what's that mean for me? Because I've never had a demon-possessed dude beat the clothing off of me, yet, but, 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 I, but, but if, if every word of Scripture is God-breathed and useful to teach us truth, then there must be something there for me. And there must be something there for you. So we need to study the story. We need to think about this. And the second part of the story that I read with you is, is really the most important part, and we're going to get there. But first, let's, let's set the stage for, by examining the first part. And I mentioned it a moment ago, let's talk about this itinerant exorcist thing. You need to learn something from this. This is super important, okay? Because the Bible says that in, in the last days that there'll be false prophets that come into the church. And they'll look like, like they're healthy, good, and there to love you, but they're wolves. And they'll teach, you, they'll, they'll teach you wrong things, and they'll steer you in the wrong direction, okay? So let's think about this word itinerant, Okay? There's a Greek word for itinerant. Can you bring that up on the screen for a second? Anyone? Yeah, there it is. Anyone want to go have a go with that one? I don't want to either. I don't want to embarrass myself. But that's the Greek word that's translated itinerant. I don't know what it says, 
but I can tell you what it means. It's in, if you look it up in the Strong's Concordance, it's number 4022. It does mean itinerant. It also means wanderer. It means stroller. And I don't mean the thing that you push your baby in. I mean the person who's pushing the baby. He's strolling. He's wandering from place to place. Here's the last definition in the book. A vagabond. Right? I think we could probably all understand that. Transient. Nomadic. A gypsy. Someone who's moving all around from place to place. Really no home. No place to call home. They're moving from place to place. And these people were itinerant, vagabond exorcists who were going around homeless and they used powerless incantation in those books and all the showmanship to take money from people that were in seemingly impossible situations. You know, this person's sick, this person's demon-possessed. I've been to the doctor. You know, they didn't have common grace like we have now with advanced medicine doctors and these amazing hospitals and MRIs and CAT scans and all these different things, right? They didn't have all that, right? You bring it to the doctor like, yeah, he's going to die. Give him some whiskey. Kill the pain. Give him something to drink, right? Others an infection. Saw his leg off. Like, it's not like that anymore, right? And so these people would bring their, their sick to, the, to their doctors, and it wasn't like it is now. And so these people go around town and say, oh, I can fix them. I can fix them for money. See, what, what was Paul doing, right? He was, he was performing miraculous deeds, mir- incredible miracles. Was he going around saying, listen, I'll, I'll heal your sick if you give me 50 bucks. He wasn't doing that, right? But these people were. These people were. There's no power of God in them to heal. There was no common grace of advanced medicine to remove illness. These were just charlatans exploiting desperate people for money. And I'm telling you right now, that still goes on. Big time. Big time. Put on your TV. And I'm not calling out any names, and I wouldn't. you got to have some discernment, man. Have some discernment, right? God's, God says in his word that, that when you believe, you, he gave you his Holy Spirit. And then you're so fortunate by God's grace, he preserved this for all these years so you can have it. And the Bible says when you become a Christian, you also have the mind of Christ. You have the spirit of Christ, the mind of Christ, and the word of Christ. Have some discernment, man. Figure out who's teaching you wrong. Still happens all the time. They weren't removing demons at all. They were phony when I read this, I don't know about you, but when I read this, I was reminded of Luke 11 when some of the religious leaders were accusing Jesus of casting out demons by the power of the head demon, Satan. And if you read it, you're going to see Jesus kind of explains all that. He's like, listen, man, no, 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 no. Satan can't kick out Satan. It doesn't work that way. That's how it's divided, right? Why, why would I kick out my own dudes? That makes no sense, right? Hey, I'm so happy you guys are here today, right? Now get out of here. I don't want to teach you nothing. I don't want you to come and serve. I don't need your prayers. Get out of here, right? Who would do such a stupid thing, right? And Jesus is like, yeah, you're stupid. That doesn't work that way. He says, listen, someone stronger than Satan is the only one who can kick out Satan, right? So you need the Spirit of God in you, right? And so <laughs> Matthew 7, this is, what, this is where my mind went next. Just follow me on this trail. It'll teach you something. Matthew chapter 7, scary, one of the scariest parts of all of Scripture. Not everyone who calls me Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven. And the people are like, but Lord, 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 we cast out demons in your name. We perform miracles in your name. We prophesied in your name. And he says, get away from me. You workers of iniquity, I never knew you. Now follow me on this trail. This is going to really, it's going to confront some of your theology. Some would say, well, he never knew them. That means they were never saved. It's a problem with that theology. I'm dry. If driving out demons, if they were driving out demons in his name, Jesus said you can't, Satan can't cast out Satan. So if they were casting out demons in his name, then they were Christians. They were Christians. And now he's looking at these people that were casting out demons in his name. 
and saying, I never knew you? Man, that's confusing. Matthew 25, story of the ten bridesmaids. We're his bride, aren't we? You're not his bride unless you're his. And the bridesmaids come and five of them get there and five of them are ready. The other five are not. Matthew 25. This is worth pausing for. Matthew 25. Later, the rest of the virgins, the bridesmaids, also came and said, Master, Master, open up for us, like, let us in. And Jesus replied, I assure you, I do not know you. Let me ask you a question. Did Jesus know them? Of course he knows. Did Jesus know where Adam was when he said, Adam, where are you? Of course he did. What he's saying here is you're not in my light. I know exactly where you are, and you're in darkness, man. You're in darkness. I never knew you. How about Ezekiel chapter 3 and Ezekiel chapter 18? They both say the same thing. If those who are righteous, listen, when you have accepted Christ. The Bible says that he brings you himself, brings you to himself, into his presence, holy, blameless, and without a single fault. You're righteous, not in what you've done, but who you are, right? You're righteous. And in Ezekiel, in both of those, in Ezekiel 3 and 18, it says, those of you who are righteous and have done righteous deeds, if you will start to, to work iniquity, I will forget your righteousness. All that we had, gone, like you never had it. So that's why, Lord, Lord, I cast out demons in your name. I perform miracles in your name. Listen, you don't perform miracles in Jesus' name unless you have Jesus in you. Yes, we sing, there is power in the name of Jesus, right? I know that, right? But the only time there's power in the name of Jesus is if it's spoken by the Spirit of Jesus coming out of the mouth of the people of Jesus. Not some phony, right? You have to be aware of this. It's super, super important. So don't be fooled, loved ones. Not everyone who throws around the the Jesus of Paul Not everyone who throws around the name of Jesus is his. And the word of God is precious to us and helps us to discern the spirits. And that's why we must study it all the time. So we can see the difference between the authentic and the phony. Now this story has a clear message. I don't know what you're seeing there, but what I'm seeing is this. That there's a far greater gain in getting to personally and intimately know Jesus than there is from simply trying to gain from Jesus. You understand? There is far greater gain in getting to personally and intimately know Jesus than there is from simply trying to gain from Jesus. These people are just trying to gain from Jesus And what he wants is you to personally and intimately know Jesus, okay? There's a massive call to you and I into relationship with our creator and our savior. Even the demon knew it. I know Jesus and I know Paul, but who are you? Right? Who are you? Of course the demon knew who Jesus was. I don't think anyone would argue with that. And and, and listen, he knew who Paul was. Why? Because the spirit of Christ that was pouring out of Paul, it was visible daily on display, right? The Lord did miraculous things through Paul. It was the spirit of Christ in Paul on display that made the, the demon stand up and take notice of who he was, right? Paul said, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me right? He goes on in Colossians 1 27, he says, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. 
right? That's what he saw. And this isn't some, listen, this isn't some one-time, one-shot deal either. It's not some one-shot deal that, that you know Jesus well. Ephesians 1.13, right? I've said this, I've, I've quoted this verse a million times in this church because it's important. That when you believed, he gave you his spirit. Right? You know Jesus then. He knows you. I get all that. But here, listen. Don't think, hey, I got the Holy Spirit. I got the Holy Spirit. I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. No, you're not. Listen, listen. Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts 13.9. It says it. You can read it. He was filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts 13.9. Yet this filled with the Holy Spirit man later on, later, later in Philippians 3.10 says this. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. I want to suffer with him, sharing even in his death. This man who knew Christ could sense that there was a a large space, way too much, way too much void, way too much need. I know Christ, but I want to know Christ, right? I want to know him more. There's, oh, listen, here's the lesson. There's always a deeper and greater knowing of Jesus Christ available to every person. You, you, there's always more. You'll never plumb the depths of his love for you. Never. You can search and search and always know more. Always know more. Paul, listen, Paul is the guy who wrote the Bible, man. He's going to be sitting there in heaven going, come on in, it's great. And, and he said, he knew Jesus. That guy, listen. The guy had a snot rag that was performing miracles. He was sucked up to the third heaven. I don't even know what that means. And he's saying, I want to know Christ. And if he wants to know Christ, how are you doing? There's a greater, deeper knowing of Jesus that is available. And he wants you to come. That's why he says, come to the throne boldly. Come to me. It's impossible to please God without faith that those who, who, who believe in him must, who come to him must believe that he exists and that he's a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. He wants you to come. He wants you to come. He could sense this lack in his own life. I wrote this down. You might want to. Knowing Christ means continually forsaking all other things. That's a big statement. I want you to see something in Scripture. We're getting close to landing the plane. Luke 14, 3. Oh, look, look, I'm going to put it on the screen. We never put it on the screen. That must mean it's important. I would never make this claim that to know Christ means to continually forsake all other things unless Jesus said it. No preacher has the right to say this. Unless Jesus said it. I think we should all read it out loud. What do you think? You see it up there on the screen? Why don't we read it all together? Come on. So likewise. We'll, we'll work on the unison thing. Of one mind and one heart. Hopefully one voice. How many people have been going to church for more than 20 years? Raise your hand. Pretty consistently. Right? How many of you would, would say honestly that the fullness of the teaching that you've heard would reflect that truth? One, two, three people. That's sad. I'm glad you've been under good teaching. I'm glad you've been under good teaching. But most of us in the room can't say that this is what's taught. We're taught that you can just, you know, give them what you can. And Jesus was asked, what what do I need to do to to receive eternal life? And he said, I want you to follow all the commands. And then I need you to sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. And the guy said, can't do that and he walked and when you know Jesus didn't go after him 
Because that's the high bar of our king. Right there. And if people would embrace this truth, you think our world would be different? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. You know what this looks like to me? Here's the wacky part of your preacher. Anyone ever, um, I, I'm not allowed to put the groceries away because I know that I, I'm going to put them back in the wrong place, right? Right? Let me just give you a little he- heads up. I've been with my wife for 10 years. I know exactly where everything goes. And I don't want to put it away. You didn't hear me say that, sweet thing. Look, is it, put, put, put up the next picture up there. That's me. Is that you? Your wife comes home from the store, right? And you're like, I'm getting every stinking bag in one trip. I'm not going back, right? Start hanging it out of your teeth and stuff, right? Here, here's the picture of forsaking all of the things. My hands are so full, right? And when you get your hands so full, right, isn't that when your kids come up to you and ask you for something? And you're like, I'm trying to get this way. Right? That's us, right? And this is the picture of the Christ follower. My hands, my life is so full of Jesus and the kingdom of God, I have no more room for anything else. That's what it's supposed to look like. Okay? That's what it's supposed to look like. But unfortunately for most of us, let's just be honest in church, this stuff represents the things of this world. And if we're lucky, we might be able to hook a little Jesus onto this available sum. Come on, right? That's what we see. I like telling the truth in church, right? This is what it is. This is why we've had 29 Sundays this year, and and some of you have been here four times, and this is your church. How are you supposed to, in turn, take what the preacher teaches and share it with other people if you're not here to listen to what the preacher's teaching? How you, where's your engaging? Where's your trying? Where's your speaking boldly, right? We're supposed to be here. Every, when Lori walked in, I'm going to use you. When you walked in, you make me smile, girl, right? Everyone feels that way about you. I don't know what it is about this lady, but she makes me smile. It makes me want to come to church knowing that she's going to be here, right? And you should feel that way. You bring your smile. I don't care if you bring a million dollars and put it in that basket, although if you have it, we'll take it. But if, I don't care about all that. I'm just happy to just smile. You're always joking around, having a good time, right? Just happy. She encourages me. How am I going to be inspired to spread a kingdom that sucks? I want to spread a kingdom that's awesome, right? I want people to come into this church and go, man, I want to be part of that kind of thing all the time. Why are we doing this only once a week? What's wrong with you, preacher? Schedule something on Tuesday. So we see this reality played out of forsaking all things in Acts chapter 19, 17 through 20. This became known to everyone who lived in Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell on all of them. And many who had become believers came confessing and disclosing their practices And many of them burned their books in front of everyone, right? They forsaking all those things. I'm I'm letting go of all these grocery bags that are filling my hands with crap that means nothing. And I'm filling my hands afresh with God and his kingdom, right? And they burned everything. So let's just break this thing down for a second here. Salvation creates response, right? Salvation creates response. I have three things, right? First, they confessed and disclosed their sin, right? They, they confessed and disclosed their sin, right? It's, it's, it's repentance. That's the first thing, okay? There's repentance. Did you know that God never asked you to ask him into your heart? Like, that's not biblical, okay? It's never in Scripture. What's in Scripture repeatedly over and over and over again is to repent of our sin and turn to God. That means acknowledging my sin and laying it down at the cross and saying, I'm not doing this anymore. That's repentance, right? 
It's, it's Jesus. He preached this. Repent and turn to God in Matthew 3, 2. Peter preached the same thing in Acts 3, 19. Peter, again, in 2 Peter 3, 9, says, God wants none to perish, but for all to repent. Paul said in Acts 13, uh, 17, 30, God commands all people everywhere to repent. Salvation must, the response to this offer of salvation is repentance. It's repentance, okay? That's the, se- that's the first thing. Here's the second thing. It requires a public profession. They confess their sins and burn their books, what? Publicly. They did it publicly, right? Salvation, salvation is very personal, right? He didn't save the guy next to you. He saved you, right? But it's never private, Paul said that I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Jesus Christ himself says in Luke 9, 26, that if anyone is ashamed of me and my message, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when I return in my glory. He said in Matthew 10, 33, anyone who denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father in heaven. And that's why we get up here at church every week and we're not ashamed and we baptize publicly and here we are attending. Here, this is where I am. I might even check in on Facebook and say, I'm at church this week and I'm open about my praying and I'm open about my giving and I'm open about my attending and I'm open about my serving and I'm open about my Savior. I don't hide it from anybody, right? Yes, it's you and it's Jesus, it's a you and Jesus thing, but it's, it's supposed to be shouted from the rooftops, right? You're supposed to let the world know. If any of you are married, you understand. It's like I'm married to that sweet thing right back there, Meredith, right? I love her. And it's very, very private. It's singular. It's her and I. I'm not married to you guys. I'm married to her. But I make it known to the world, right? I, I have a tattoo ring on my hand that says I'm married to her. Look, I even got a t-shirt with her name on it. Right? I talk about her, and I love public displays of, of affection. I don't care if you like it or not. I'm going to kiss her and hug her in front of you. If you don't like it, turn the cheek. Right? I don't care about that. I don't mind. I want everybody to know, right? I want everybody to know that I'm owned by Jesus and managed by Meredith. That's the way it works. I'm not ashamed of these things, right? I'm not ashamed of my relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm not going to hide it. I'm never going to be quiet. I'll never stop talking about it. Never. Never. Okay? Never. So response means to repent. It it requires going public. Here's the third thing. We touched on it earlier. It's going to cost you something. They burned their books. Remember? Several million dollars. They didn't try to slow down their sin. They didn't try to manage their sin. They burned their sin. They burned their sin. Jesus said, if, if, if your eye causes you to, to stumble, pluck it out. Right? It's better to go in with, 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 with one eye than to burn in hell. Right? He's serious about this stuff. Burn your sin. Get rid of it. Dump it. Right? If you're watching porn on your computer, put a friggin' hammer through your computer screen. Okay? That's what you need to do. Take some action. Do something. Right? Following Jesus is going to cost you something. If money's your idol and that's what you spend your time trying to accumulate, then burn the freaking money too, just like they burn their books. Burn your money. If your job is your idol, it defines who you are. It defines your value. It defines your success. It, it, it's consuming so much time and your attention that it keeps you from earnestly seeking your relationship and serving Jesus. And it robs God from the opportunity to pour all that he desires into your hands because you're full of work, 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 work. Then quit your job and go find another one. Okay? Make him a priority in your life. Are you in a relationship that's not God-honoring? Is there sexual immorality that just you don't want to let go of because it feels good? Am I offering my body to immorality when God says to give my body to him if you're in that relationship break it off honor God honor God following Christ means you forsake all else and these things that are keeping me from truly knowing him and the power of his resurrection they need to go even if it's costly and so let me ask you a question loved ones take a second What needs to go? What needs to go? What's blocking? What's blocking? Listen, if you're doing something wrong, fix it today.
today. Fix it now. Don't wait till this afternoon. Don't wait till next week. Fix it now. Fix it now, loved ones. Fix it now. Now, don't lose sight of the fact that your individual convictions that God's laying on you right now like a hammer, they're individual, but this study is corporate. The study of the book of Acts is corporate. We're here as a corporate entity together. Don't lose sight of why we're studying the book of, of, of response, the book of expectation. It's the mission of advancing Christ's church to all people, to the ends of the earth, Right? So here's how we close. Repent. Repent. Maybe there was a day years ago that you repented of your sin and you came down the aisle and you gave your life to Christ. But maybe Jesus would look at your life right now and say, I never knew you. We had a thing. We had a thing, man, and, and you, were, you were loving me and you were serving me and you were worshiping me and now you're, you're a worker of iniquity. You're, you're lawless. Someone asked Jesus, who's your mother and father and brother? Who's your family? And he said, the ones who follow God's commands. That's the ones. Repent. So repent today. Openly shed all things that are in the way of advancing God's kingdom. Get rid of them, I beg you. I beg you, get rid of them. And pursue a deep, personal knowing, a deeper, personal knowing of Jesus Christ. And then I would just say this, it's time to flip your tassel once and for all, from hearing to doing. What's it look like for you? Is it the home group? Is it committing to coming and listening and hearing, coming to, the, to pray, be part of the solution to our problem and come and pray? Just being honest with you, I'm a little tired of coming in. As the, the people that come and pray, I love them, but I'm tired of opening up a 10,000 square foot building for four of us to come and pray. I think it's more important than that. Maybe it's this. Maybe it's time you go from student to teacher and start to disciple somebody. Right? Maybe it's time for you to disciple somebody. If it is, let me know and I'll help you. But let's just close here as we begin to pray. I want you to pray with me. But it said... When they did this, when they did this, when they engaged and tried and spoke boldly, everyone heard the word of the Lord. And people got saved. And they openly confessed their sin and burned their books. And it says, in this way, the Lord's message flourished and prevailed. And isn't that what we want? Isn't that what God wants? You will receive power from upon high. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now go and make disciples of all the people baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them all that I have taught you. And loved ones, it's going to take that for all the inhabitants of the world to hear the word of the Lord. Lord God, we thank you for this message. I personally thank you, first and foremost, for the message. Thank you for your word Thank you for inspiring me again, although I've been so down and you are so faithful and I'm so glad that we got to sing the songs that we got to sing today because you are good and you have been faithful. And I thank you for your message this morning. And I'm believing right now in the name of Jesus that these folks that have now heard the message will graduate from hearer to doer. 
And they will pass on these truths that they have now heard this morning to others so they might know you. They might love you. There's a world filled with darkness and hopelessness and it's your gospel that saved us and it's your gospel that will save them and bring hope into the darkest places. You want us to go? Help us to be ready to do that right now, Lord. Help us to graduate from hearer to doer. Lord, we're, we're part of your kingdom. It's all about you. Christ, you're all that matters. We forsake all things for you now. You want us to spread the, your word, your message to the ends of the earth. You want it to prevail. You want it to flourish. We're going to give right now. We're going to generously give right now. Because that's what we're doing when we give. We're funding it. We're taking now what you've given us and we're giving it to you and saying, Lord, use it to spread the gospel. Build the kingdom. Our gifts are bricks. Giving, giving, giving to, to spread the kingdom of God. We don't want to hold on to everything. We want to forsake it all. Give it to you, Lord. Use it for you. That's why we give. So loved ones, as we always do here at our church, take a few moments in the silence with expectation that God will lead you and prompt you in some way to ask him what thanksgiving looks like. Ask him what generosity looks like. Ask him what partnering with him to advance his church, what's it look like? And then just give. So